Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session one, uh, Adversary Concepts for Competition and Limited War at Sea. The aim of the session is to explore how key adversaries envision maritime power fitting into their overarching security strategies, to understand in what ways opponents are attempting to offset maritime or Western maritime strengths in particular, to identify what challenges this poses for Western and allied approaches to maritime power projections, and finally, to discuss what potential response options we have when it comes to addressing these challenges. I am privileged to chair a distinguished panel this, uh, this afternoon, uh, and I'll introduce them in the speaking order. First off is Mr. Michael Kaufman, who is director of the Russia Studies Program at CNA and fellow at the Kennan Institute of the Woodrow Wilson International Center in Washington, DC. His research focuses on Russia and the former Soviet Union, as well as Russian armed forces, military thought, capabilities, and strategy. Secondly, we have Professor James Holmes, who is Professor of Strategy and the inaugural J.C. Wiley Chair of Maritime Strategy at the U.S. Naval War College. His areas of expertise include maritime strategy, China, and the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And I also feel compelled to say that General Jim Mattis has described him as troublesome, so looking forward to his comments today. Last but certainly not least, Professor Anthony Kordsman is the Arleigh A. Burke Chair in Strategy at CSIS. Dr. Kordsman has previously held the position of Director of the CSIS Gulf Net Assessment Project and the Gulf in Transition Study. His current research projects include a net assessment of the Indian Ocean region, Chinese military developments, changes in the nature of modern war, and assessments of US defense strategy and programs. So I think we have a very distinguished panel who will no doubt address all your questions later on. Um, our panelists will provide about 10 to 12 minute opening remarks followed by a Q&A. Please note that the presentations are on the record, but the Q&A afterwards is strictly off the record. So to get us started with no further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Kaufman to deliver his remarks. Mr. Kaufman, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the kind invitation to participate in this event. Uh, I plan to actually do what I uh, hope might be an interesting and fairly brief PowerPoint to uh, offer viewers something to look at during my remarks. And I plan to share that with the audience and right here. If everyone can see this. Excellent. Okay, so um, my goal is to brof, uh, fairly briefly give coverage of uh, the role of the Russian Navy in Russian concepts for uh, strategic deterrence, escalation management, and a little bit on the operational Rus role of the Russian Navy in the event of war. That is, what does the Russian Navy contribute to Russian military strategy writ large across different sort of conflict scenarios? Um, all the wellspring of Russian contemporary concepts on deterrence is really an attempt to establish a framework for how you can integrate different instruments of national power to deter a stronger opponent, contain them, coerce them in a crisis, uh, to prevent escalation, or attain war termination on acceptable terms, right? So strategic deterrence is a big picture national security concept that's officially defined as a system of forceful military and non-forceful military, non-military measures intended to restrain the other side from employing force against the Russian Federation, particularly on a strategic scale. Strategic deterrence measures are used continuously in peacetime, not just to deter, but to contain, and wartime for the purpose of escalation management, right? So here I'll uh, show kind of this first slide and lay out this concept. And if you look on it, the focus is really on the right side of the ledger on what are the um, military uh, measures. And uh, they break down primarily into non-nuclear and nuclear capabilities. And the nuclear side, which you see is typically general purpose forces and tools, select conventional capabilities that are considered to be conventional, such as long range precision standoff weapons, missile defense and the like, electronic warfare, directed energy weapons, and then non-strategic and strategic nuclear weapons. All right, so these measures are designed to manage escalation in wartime and their implementation typically ranges from demonstrations of force, weapon tests and the like, to calibrated use of force with conventional and in further stages of the conflict, nuclear weapons. What does the Navy do and what role does the Navy play in all of this, first and foremost? So in peacetime, the Navy's goal is really to attain presence in strategic regions of the world ocean, 
through visible exercises to ensure access to resources that Russia believes it's competing for in the maritime domain, to control sea lines of communication like the Northern Sea Route, and to show itself in the four kind of strategic uh, uh, oceanic theaters of military action. And these generally are the Atlantic, Pacific, Arctic, and the Indian Ocean. It's a little bit harder for the Russian Navy because many of you know, most of Russia's capital ships are really nuclear powered submarines, right? But those who need to know uh, often do understand when they're out and on patrol. So let me show you what is unfortunately a busy slide and I promise you can I only have one of these because you can usually only get away with one of these in a PowerPoint presentation. Um, talk about the Russian Navy's role in escalation management. The Navy figures very prominently in Russia's strategic deterrence forces. These are not to be confused with the nuclear deterrent. They are not the same thing. The Russian military is functionally designated more into three types of forces. General purpose forces, which is the war fighting, strategic deterrence forces, which combine select nuclear and conventional capabilities because it's believed that they have a clear deterrent effect on an adversary, both during a threatened period of conflict and in the war itself, and quick reaction forces. Okay. The uh, Russian Navy uh, contributes to these concepts because they are very heavily predicated on deterrence through cost and position, where it is believed that defense is either impossible or impractical in terms of how difficult or how costly it might be to defend against certain types of attacks. For example, mass conventional and airspace strike. The Navy sold itself in its modernization program early on, on the basis that it could bring strategic conventional, non-strategic nuclear, and strategic nuclear capabilities to the deterrence or war fighting equation. It has the full spectrum of toolkit required. So during peacetime and a period of military threat, which is in yellow on the left side of the slide, it is able to contribute to deterrence through fear inducement, right? Active demonstrations, deployments, weapon tests and the like, showing itself out there. Then if a conflict begins, it contributes to deterrence through limited use of force, calibrated application of coercive power, and via defense, or it, to put it more accurately in terms of Russian naval operational art, a damage limitation strategy. So the Navy is able to intimidate through demonstration of its ability to destroy an opponent's vitally important objects. That is, it can threaten visibly that which the other side holds dear, critical economic infrastructure and the like, things that are significant to political and military leaders, things they care about can also threaten all sorts of other things like undersea communications infrastructure, right? This is one area where Russia's main directorate of deep sea research uh, operates. And it adapts based on the opponent's response in peacetime. That is, it's very, these concepts are iterative. Uh, its advantage to the Russian military is, it is far more visible than other forces or services, right? When it deploys. So it can create a real psychological effect on opponents relative to other forces. In an event of conflict, the Navy is capable of conducting fairly precise singular group strikes, either with conventional capabilities or nuclear capabilities, and is able to inflict what the Russians call deterrent damage. This is a degree of damage that is tailored and calibrated to the opponent, that's designed to ideally induce a stage of de-escalation or war termination on terms acceptable to Russia, and those based much less on actual material damage inflicted and much more on the psychological effect it's likely to have on opponent's uh, leadership. The Navy is also the main component of the military that is able to support expeditionary operations, or Russians call a strategy of limited operations abroad. Therefore, it is most able to realize Russian's foreign policy outside of its immediate neighboring regions and attain some degree of power projection to neighboring regions. So here it plays a very important role. Let me talk a little bit beyond the sort of escalation management uh, path about the Russian Navy's role in actual war fighting and contemporary outlooks on uh, the Navy's uh, role in Russian military strategy. First, a brief picture of kind of the Russian general staff problem slide. Okay, so the this is a bit reductionist, but it can be summarized as a massed airspace strike delivered from both air and the sea that inflicts paralyzing levels of damage in the Russian military or unacceptable levels of damage to the country's infrastructure. And this strike is principally conventional. Um, and, and the military's kind of overall uh, concept for how they describe 
uh, their military strategy is called active defense. And the reason it's called that is because it prominently features the deployment of high readiness forces to preemptively neutralize threats as they appear, right? And while it carries the defensive characters, the actual operations that define the strategy are offensive and defensive in nature. That is, it's very hard to parse offense and defense from it. It is actually both. And they're very much focused on pairing the initial strike that comes from the maritime domain uh, and then conducting a counterattack. Um, the big difference between it and other strategies, it is not oriented around offensive to seize territory in the initial period of war, right? But here you have a picture of basically surface action groups conducting deep strikes into Russia or intercepting Russian missiles and, and precision guided weapons in the European theater. Okay, that's my last slide. Uh, the Navy's operational role really can be broken down to four clear, clear pieces, right? The first is a damage limitation strategy. Its job in the initial period of war is to destroy key adversary forces at sea, which carry what the Russian military sees as strategic conventional capabilities, that is long range cruise missiles and the like. Um, this means attritioning the strike forces at sea out in the far sea zone. This is kind of the orange bits that I've highlighted on the map and attempting to deflect their initial strike, right? This is different from defense. In defense, the other side gets to go first. In damage limitation, you have to go first because once they fire their missiles, you've done absolutely nothing to help defend Russia from the actual strike, right? So, and I wanna highlight that difference between people who advocate that this is a layered defense strategy versus what is a damage limitation strategy. Second, the destruction of critically important objects on land to undermine the opponent's ability to fight. The, the Soviet Navy really could not do this effectively, but the contemporary Russian Navy can, and it can do this with fairly uh, small platforms because what matters is the capabilities that they carry, not so much the size of the ship. Um, the strong Russian belief that destroying an opponent's forces is not required to win in modern conflict, plus they can always build more. What is much more important is to destroy either their ability to sustain the fight or their will to fight. And that's where the Russian Navy contributes by taking out critically important objects for that fight on land. Third is sea denial in the near sea, uh, in the near sea zone and sea control of these maritime approaches. And of course, defending the strategic nuclear deterrent at sea, such that the opponent understands that Russia can always inflict unacceptable levels of damage upon them in the event of nuclear retaliation. Yeah. And, uh, and a degree of uh, presence and sort of showing the flag and, and uh, status projection in what is officially called the world ocean that I referred to at the beginning. And you can see the world ocean actually is not that far out from, from Russia's borders. Uh, and you'll typically see a handful of Russian ships out there doing ports of call visits and the like. So I'll conclude by uh, just mentioning three basic expectations of the Russian Navy today. Uh, the first is that Russian naval forces will establish what could be considered to be barricade zones where an opponent will be afraid to deploy strike platforms at sea. So there's a sort of far sea zone that will be contested because of the amount of attrition they might be able to impose on them, at least in the early phases of conflict, and try to take away the opponent's maritime arm. The second is the military strategy calls for attrition over annihilation to inflict sufficient losses early on to convince opponents that a decisive victory in the initial period of war is not possible and it's going to be a costly fight and try to preserve Russia's forces to the extent possible, right, through defensive maneuver and get the opponent to negotiate. The third is application of dose damage against opponents' homelands to convince them that they should avoid further escalation, right, to potentially get a coalition to collapse or to terminate the conflict on acceptable terms, right. And finally, the Russian thesis sort of prevails that um, uh, the Navy, uh, of course, a, and sometimes a, a lesser stepchild was principally a vast land power and a general staff dominated by officers from the land forces. But nonetheless, Gorshkov's thesis uh, is still relevant today, that at the end of the day, armies win the war, but it is navies that determine the peace. So with that, I'd like to conclude my uh, brief and turn it over to our uh, great moderator here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. And I particularly like those last four points that you made. And number two really struck out to me um, as a Sinologist myself, uh, where I lead uh, the Indo-Pacific program here at London, uh, at RUSI. I, I like this point of attrition over annihilation. I think that's something that we see in other adversary uh, Navy kind of strategies as well. But building on that, uh, Professor Holmes, uh, the floor is yours to give us your presentation. Thank you. 
Colleagues, it's a, it's a thrill to be with you this morning, or actually this afternoon for your on your time. Uh, the question put to me for today is, what are some aspects of the Western way of maritime war that our opponents can exploit? Well, I chose two, and I elected to use sports, and in particular, the concept of the home team advantage as my organizing device for, uh, for today. The two aspects are these. First, Western sea services are almost always the visiting team in warfare. The United States has long pursued a rimland strategy around the Eurasian periphery, which by definition means we have to travel intercontinental distances, probably through contested waters and skies, just to get to the field of battle. We have to fight to get to the fight, as a U.S. Marine Commandant put it not that long ago. Just look at this World War II map that's uh, displayed before you, just demonstrating how Lend-Lease supplies got to overseas allies in mid-1941 before the United States joined the fighting. The map hints at how an opponent might obstruct our access. You'll notice the access had closed the Mediterranean to, to Allied shipping at that point. The problem of geography is at least as vexing in the Pacific today as it was back then. And when we do get to the battlefield, we confront a difficult strategic question. Namely, what happens when a fraction of your team goes up against the whole of a hostile team on that team's home field or court? Adversaries now predicate their strategies on trying to make that quandary insoluble for our leaders. What we call anti-access refers to using sea and shore-based weapons and sensors to keep an opponent's reinforcements from ever reaching the stadium. Area denial refers to using those systems to attack players already on the field, such as the Japan-based US 7th Fleet and affiliated joint forces. Chinese anti-access strategy envisions pummeling U.S. forces forward deployed along the East Asian rimland while preventing the larger U.S. Pacific fleet from reaching the battleground from its home ports in Hawaii or on the West Coast in time to affect a war's outcome. In other words, the Chinese Communist Party wants to set the terms of access to its maritime environments. This is a nettlesome problem for expeditionary forces. Secondly, Western maritime, excuse me, Western maritime services fight in systems that depend heavily on the electromagnetic spectrum to pass information and instructions to the constituent parts of the system and back. The components, the nodes in the system are ships, planes, armaments, sensors, and so forth. A system could be a large formation such as a fleet, amphibious brigade, or expeditionary air force. It could be something smaller like a surface action group. Taking the concept to, ex to its extreme, an individual warship is itself a system of systems, relying on various subsystems to propel the hull through the water, generate electricity, detect, track, it, tr track and target it hostile forces, and on and on. The same goes for other complex platforms. This interdependence among subsystems creates opportunity for our competitors. Attacking a military system may, but need not, involve kinetic measures such as missile attacks. If an adversary can reach into that ship and disrupt its internal workings, it is carrying out a type of systems destruction attack. It could make mayhem by launching a cyber attack. It could even use social media to distract and confuse the crew. So our dependence on the EM spectrum creates opportunity for a local defender such as China to disrupt our operations. To continue with our sporting analogy, this is roughly akin to a hostile home crowd shouting at the top of their lungs to interfere with coaching decisions or communications among the visitors on the field. And indeed, China's People's Liberation Army thinks in terms of defeating systems rather than military forces as traditionally understood. We need to comprehend this strategy to vanquish the home team on its own turf. So clearly, Western Sea Services face stubborn problems of geography and technology, along with asymmetries in how we make war. How do we work around these problems? What I have to say about potential remedies is simple. But as Kozovitz reminds us, the simplest thing is difficult to pull off in strategic competition and warfare. So let me offer six general recommendations. First, we must politically diversify our system, our combined armed forces, by making our alliances indiv indivisible. We have made progress in this front to the point where U.S. Navy commanders now talk about interchangeability among allied forces rather than mere interoperability, which refers to the ability to work together despite dissimilar hardware tactics or procedures. Rather than assemble a task force out of units from multiple sea services, which has been common practice since the inception of NATO or the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance, interchangeability could result in mixed crews and true integration. In fact, it is happening here in the Atlantic before our eyes. The push for interchangeability is especially noteworthy in the realm of carrier aviation. 
As Admiral Kidd noted in his opening remarks, the, the Royal Navy's first supercarrier, HMS Queen Elizabeth, is preparing to make its first deployment with a U.S. Marine F-35 squadron, making up the bulk of the vessel's fixed-wing aircraft contingent. French fighter pilots have flown from U.S. Fl flight decks in recent years to stay proficient when their home, get home carrier was undergoing a refit. Just last week, the Italian carrier Cavour put into Norfolk, Virginia to certify its crew to operate F F-35s. These are feel-good news stories. The more allied fleets come to resemble a unified democratic armada, the better for all of us. Mingling people and hardware puts potential foes on notice that no antagonist can splinter our military fellowships in wartime. It announces that we have skin in the game of our common cause. Second, we need to make geography our ally. The complex thing about maritime East Asia is that not just one home team, but two, China and Japan have taken the field. In fact, they have carried on a running series since about the seventh century AD. Japan has been on top since 1895. China wants to avenge past defeats and the United States-Japan Alliance wants to keep the winning streak going. Using Japanese geography in concert with sea power could, could let us give China a very bad day by bottling up naval and mercantile shipping within the first island chain or preventing whatever happens to be outside the island chain from returning home. Sorting out the politics of island chain warfare is of prime importance in the strategic competition, as is assuring our navies and air and ground forces can fight together in the near shore domain. If successful, we will make the US-Japan Alliance the dominant home team along the island chain. Third, we must diversify our system militarily by adding more nodes. Straightforward. This is partly a function of alliance relations, as I noted. More partners are better. They add assets to the team. I am sensing a recurring theme here, namely alliances. It's partly about tapping the maritime potential of armies and ground-based air forces, which are increasingly able to shape events at sea and coordinate with fleets. It's partly about new construction, adding more nodes to the system in the forms of ship, aircraft, and sensors. And it's partly a matter of dispersing firepower more widely, presumably aboard, aboard a bigger fleet of smaller ships and planes, an increasing share of them unmanned and perhaps autonomous. By adding raw numbers of hulls and airframes while spreading out weaponry among them, we concentrate a smaller percentage of our overall combat power in each node. That means the system as a whole can absorb losses and carry on, which is what it's all about in strategy and operations. Fourth, we need to harden our system, making, making it difficult for an antagonist to cut the sinews binding it all together. What Chinese strategists call systems destruction warfare aims at weakening or breaking the links that hold the system together and then attacking its scattered nodes as necessary. To defeat this mode of sea combat, Western forces need to assure mutual support and connectivity among the nodes. Efforts to fortify a system against an attack will unfold mainly in such shadowy realms as cyber warfare, electronic warfare, and management of the force's electromagnetic signature. A mix of offensive and defensive measures will make it rougher on an opponent to fragment our systems. Fifth, we should identify substitute hardware and methods in advance so that operators have a fallback in case a successful kinetic, physical, or non-kinetic assault of some sort fractures the system. This might, but need not, involve developing sort of some sort of high-tech solution. It might involve reverting to older but time-proven methods. We might even see such things as signal flags or flashing light signals make a comeback in fleets riding the waves. To name one such a reversion to past practice, the United States Navy has made a long overdue course correction in recent years by reinstating celestial navigation tra training at Navy schoolhouses, such as Annapolis and places like that. By relearning how to navigate by the stars, we partly weaned our ships away from GPS, any savvy opponent's prime target in wartime. Furthermore, newly developed weapons are designed to function in a degraded tactical setting. The logic behind such measures is straightforward. If we can't find our way from point A to point B or detect, track, target, and engage enemy forces, we can accomplish little, even if the adversary never shoots down one of our planes or sinks a ship. So, develops, so developments such as these are all to the good. And lastly, we need to ensure our joint doctrine is adequate and that the people overseeing the systems components are well versed in it so they know what to do should they find themselves cut off from communication with or coordination from top commanders. Much as the visiting team has to cope with hostile crowd noise that interferes with play calling and execution, we need to expect the home team to use its advantages to interfere with our command and control. 
and prepare our players to function effectively despite degraded operational and tactical conditions. Practicing the way we expect to play will make this second nature for seafarers and improve our prospects for an acceptable outcome to a fight. If we can convince an opponent like China that we would win, we improve our chances of never having to play a game none of us wants to play. We improve our chances to deter. If we are successful, the opponent will forfeit or at any rate postpone seeking its goals by force. Good things could happen in the, mid, in the meantime on the political front. So clearly, prevailing is tough when you're the visiting team. Fortunately, sea service leaders realize we have a problem. If we put our heads and resources together as allies and friends, we stand a good chance of solving that problem. And we'll, with that, I will turn it back to our, to our host. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Um, I love a good uh, sports analogy, so that was wonderful. Um, and I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions uh, out of your presentation, but I particularly like the fact that you've got six recommendations, which I'm sure we can just dig into later. Um, but last but not least, of course, we have Professor Kordsman. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And if I could have the first slide in the PowerPoint. I don't see it. Uh, is it called up? Nope, I think we seem to be having some technical issues, but just bear with us for one minute and we'll try and get it up. Well, let me, I won't say dissent, but I have been involved in this business, I think for longer than I care to think of, some 60 years since the Kennedy administration. I spent some 20 years in the office of the Secretary of Defense, the NSC and NATO. And I have a somewhat different approach to what I believe is happening in sea power. If I could have the second slide. The focus on worst case war fighting is necessary. You have to have the forces to deal with escalation if it gets out of control. But I don't believe that that is the objective of Russia, of China, or of most of the countries which are potential opponents, either in sea power or war fighting. And I think particularly in the case of China, we need to rethink our definition of sea power. I believe China will compete primarily on a political and economic level. It will use sea power in very limited ways to achieve essentially political and economic objectives. It already has departed significantly from market driven norms and its plans through 2030 will make that departure more and more important in terms of sea power. Its so-called road and belt approach to some extent is finding substitutes for shipment and the merchant marine. How successful that will be is certainly debatable. It hasn't happened yet. And a lot of what China is setting as goals may not be achieved. But in terms of sea power, China may well focus far more on trade, on putting pressure on individual states in Asia and around the world, on finding ports and basing facilities, on using investments in infrastructure to take control over naval and port facilities. It does not have to fight to win. And in fact, the problem for China is essentially the same as the West. If you have a major war where deterrence fails, basically neither side can actually win or occupy the other, and you are pushed into a level of competition which becomes very directly unaffordable. Now, as we look at China, the thing to remember here and I am always surprised that nobody ever mentions this in discussions of sea power or military power in general, is who has the resources to compete. 
The most favorable estimates I've seen of Chinese spending are somewhere around 40% of the United States alone. The problem with that is the spending keeps increasing. And if you look at the figures on fleet size, the West, including US shipbuilding, has fallen far short of the rate of Chinese construction and deployment. Quite honestly, it is very hard to figure out where an awful lot of the resources have gone over the past 20 years that went into any aspect of military power. When we look at Russia, I think it too faces essentially economic challenges. It is spending roughly a third of what NATO Europe is spending on defense, even by the highest estimates of the IISS, CIPRI, or the recent estimates by our Defense Intelligence Agency. It does, however, have the ability to use pipelines, to use commercial shipping, to put pressure on given spots and areas of focus in Europe, the Mediterranean, the Black Sea, and possibly at least inside the Gulf or in the Gulf of Oman. I think when we really talk about war, we are often going to be talking about clashes, things that involve blocks to tanker and marine traffic, gray area and proxy and spoiler warfare. And the problem I find is that the natural tendency to focus on the worst case seems to mean we're not focusing on the most likely case or certainly the intentions of our Chinese opponent. If I could have the next slide. So what do we have to do? I think one thing is to focus on the full spectrum of conflicts in here, ruthless economic competition is merely an extension of war by other means. To try to separate some of China's policies simply because they're economic or trade oriented or they involve investment leverage from military or security efforts is unrealistic and impractical. The other problem is creating effective regional capabilities and strategic partnerships. Quite honestly, having been involved in NATO force planning and the international staff, having spent several decades dealing with US planning in dealing with the Pacific and the Indian Ocean and the Gulf, and having looked at some of the studies by groups like RUSI of the patterns of naval construction and modernization in Europe, I think we need to be extremely careful about talking about a natural movement toward effective partnership. The United States Navy completed this year a study of what it called joint all domain warfare. And in the process, it trotted out all of the complex issues in terms of command and control, targeting, intelligence sharing, sensor integration. The problem is that these are issues we have not yet solved. And we haven't solved them at the national level. There are still significant problems in integrating the F-35 into the full nature of existing naval warfare systems. And no one has yet defined in practical terms, all domain warfare. I think about the only area where we have consistently underestimated cost and time more than shipbuilding is in these areas. And if you look at the cost history of them, at least for the US, it is a somewhat frightening data. So one real question, we cannot afford to go on praising ourselves for the achievements we have not yet made. 
making sea power affordable and on time and fully effective is something the United States Navy has not done for the last 20 years. I haven't seen that much more effectiveness and I don't want to get into details on any European or Asian power. But there is also the fact that whatever we do, sea power will have to compete with land and air power and civil programs. And very often, almost all of the cost projections indicate the money isn't going to be there to actually buy what current navies are planning to buy. The average figure for US cost escalation in terms of its recent shipbuilding program from the actual beginning of the fully defined ship to the deployment of the first ship is 38%. Those figures are a warning and they're scarcely unique to the United States. And life cycle costs, O&M costs have risen. In the full brief I gave to Rusi, I put out a lot of these cost escalation data. I think we need to be a little more honest about the risk imposed by missiles, weapons like smart mines, so-called magic bullets. And then the question is, if the war does escalate to intense combat, even if you win, how do you terminate or do you simply go on to a new form of even more demanding in competition? A question that I think General Petraeus asked in Afghanistan is even more real. How does this war end? And if you can't figure out a stable political outcome, the military victory tends to be a bit pyrrhic by any standard. Just very quickly and to close, an illustration of some of the issues involved. Please skip on to the first map in this presentation. This is the Navy's description of the operational environment in 2021. You'll notice this is a very traditional view of sea power. And almost all of it deals with how do we compete without going to the major levels of war. It didn't reflect the new US strategy, which focused on China and Russia. Like a lot of, shall we say, budget requests, even those the Secretary of the Navy approves, there is kind of a one year lag in the graphics. Now let's look at next year's. That's the next slide. All of a sudden, we're back to cables. Fair enough. We are talking about the role of the Chinese Navy rather than Chinese sea power involving mercantile traffic and its interaction with other ways of distributing economic goods and services. And you have the Russian Navy basically somehow rather dominating the Mediterranean, which came to me at least as a little bit of a surprise. This is not the way to approach the real world. And if you approach it the way that some of the people have discussed it this morning, I can guarantee you one thing, you're not going to get the forces, you're not going to get the money, and you'll have substituted good intentions for the reality of alliance warfare at sea. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for that um, rather sobering assessment, I think, after some more upbeat <laughs> presentations right before you. But you know, I do think it's very important, as you say, to keep in mind some of the misunderstandings or misinterpretations of what we do see going on uh, with regards to adversary um, naval capabilities and uh, potentially intense and strategy there. So um, your points on China resonated uh, quite strongly with me. Mm -hmm.